Right. Uh, the rest of you, if possible, uh, please turn on your camera. It just makes for a more interactive experience. Otherwise, uh, let's start with the argument format and rebuttal generation. I also want this, we have a small group, so we'll have this be slightly more interactive than last session. And uh, I really want you guys to lead this. First up, can anyone tell me just any motion that they've done recently? Yeah, Devyan. Um, this house would replace um human judgment with artificial intelligence in criminal sentencing decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yasne. This house would put up advisories on the path using of animal products. Oh, uh, okay. This house would put up advisories on the packaging of animal products. Um, if I'm not mistaken, so it's not, it's, it, was it graphic images of animal suffering or was it advisories? Yeah, it was graphic imaging. Um, yeah. The ISDS regional. Yeah. Team. It's a common. All right. Does everyone understand this motion as in like what it entails? Uh, yes. Okay. So basically on all packages of let's say meat or handbags or leather products, you'll put like pictures of animals suffering and bleeding and whatnot. Now, someone tell me, what are the two broad types of arguments we have in debates? Uh, you have principal arguments and you have practical arguments. Mm -hmm. Someone tell me the difference. Okay, so principal arguments try to debate over the morality of the particular thing that whether or not it is morally acceptable to the society and to the public and to the stakeholders at last. And practical argumentation tries to delve over the idea that even irrespective of the fact that it is moral or not, is it practically beneficial and possible to happen in the very case? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's an all right definition. So to use what you said and modify it a little, principal arguments are concerned with morals. Now, morals is a term that are thrown around quite a lot in debate. So we'll start off with principal arguments because I think a lot of people get this wrong. When you're making a principal argument, I think at least what I do is to think in the real world, what kind of rules do we have in society and why do we have those rules is a good place to start about when you think about principles or models. So, for example, uh, can someone who hasn't spoken yes tell, yet tell me why you think it's illegal for me to just take your phone and look through your text messages? Invasion of privacy. Yeah, it is an invasion of privacy, but why is that a bad thing? Yeah. It violates <laughs> one's right to privacy. Yeah, we're on the same page. I am violating your right to privacy if I steal your phone and look at your text messages. But why is that a bad thing? Why, why is it important? Yeah, Snay. Yeah, probably because when we live in a society, a society is not made up of people coming together as blocks of ideas, but rather people standing individually and agreeing to someone's consent, right? That is to say that in each and every scenario, your role in this entire large spectrum is crucial, but your role to yourself, that is to say what you are as an individual is also crucial. And that in and that very sense of individuality is somewhat mistaken and is somewhat undermined when you try to go through someone's right to privacy or you try to undermine it because then you're a not exactly 
taking their consent, but B, you're also undermining what they really are. But I don't understand why you're undermining what they are. Why do I need your consent? If I if the police thinks that you have drugs hidden in your house, they reserve the right to just break into your house and look if they have a warrant. You still haven't told me why it's important that you consent to me looking to your phone. Let's stop here. And this is one of the main issues that happen with principal arguments. I think everyone kind of caught on when I said that's a violation of your right to privacy. And that is the first part of developing a principal argument, which is identifying the principle at hand. These are usually, these can be rights, these can be obligations. Yeah, usually just these two things. But that is not enough. Where most people mess up is the second part which is answering the question, why is the principle important? Which is what I tried to get you guys to explain to me, or why does it matter? Uh, slash, why does it matter? Why should we follow it? What happens if we don't follow it? Actually, let's not get into the last. Then we look at something called exceptions. And I'll explain this in a moment. Is this a valid exception? All right. So whenever you make a principal argument, I want you to follow these steps. So now let's try this for this motion. Someone identify a principal. Uh, right to privacy. Sorry? Uh, the principle here is right to privacy and consent. I guess those Why? are the two main things. Why so? Um, oh, wait, sorry, not with this motion. Uh, with the previous one. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. So if I say, uh, okay, well, why why may I have an obligation or why may producers okay let me ask you a different thing why do we put graphic images of like lung cancer on cigarette packages on a principal level oh my thing is because it's the state's duty to inform the citizens about the potential harms of a product right so we've identified the Oh, one second. We mixed a very crucial part, which is Sorry for missing this out. This is probably the most important part of, or rather the part where people mess up the most. And then we can look at exception. All right. Does everyone understand the principle? Can someone, apart uh, who just spoke? Or Sambhav. Okay, so can someone apart from Sambhav explain to me why the right to information may be important if you're constructing a principal argument around this motion. Um, is it because the government also has a right to uh, right to inform the citizens in what manner their food is being uh, processed or is being manufactured? They have to show how these animals are being treated and you know inform the citizens what are they actually consuming. Yeah. I think that's fair enough. 
So now we have identified the principle. Now can someone tell me why it's important? This is the, well, I'd say these two parts are really where people struggle the most. And this is where debates or other principles are won and lost. So can someone tell me why is it important that I should know the way my meat was produced? Probably because we need to direct the way our impact is made, right? So um, we need to sorry. Direct the way our impact is made. So let's just taking let taking the example of a cigarette only. If a person does go ahead and smokes that particular object and does consume the amount of harm that it does on its body then the issue with that thing is that they were a not aware about the harms of it but b that how the producers made it that way that they would not be aware about it right that how we somewhat causing harm to an individual to such an extent that they are not exactly a part of the entire process leading to further disengagement in the entire um, spectrum so how does this differ? So how do you adapt that to this motion? Right. So, in smoke, so in smoking it, you may not be aware that you're harming your own lungs. So how would you adapt that? It's important to be informed because it's important to be informed about harms. So how would you make that specific to this motion? Right, to make it specific to this motion, I'll first characterize what the meat industry looks like, right? So the meat industry is at the end of the day, a capitalistic platform wherein you've got these bad living situations for all the animals that are over there and that how somehow you end up investing into it without knowing and that how you might not propagate that harm but you end up doing it and that complacency is at the end of the day a crime itself and you don't want people to be complacent criminals. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to define it, which is that people deserve to know if they are contributing to some kind of harm. Now, can someone else tell me why is putting graphic images of, of animal suffering the only way to inform people about this? Why can't I just put a text saying, this, this, this happened to an animal. Because that's what opposition is going to say. So I think that impact is best created right in that like instant of time. Because in that like one particular instant, people are willing to overlook certain things because, for example, the packaging looks attractive or the meat looks attractive or whatever. But, in, but if you're willing to, you know, um, you know, advertise graphic content in that, you know, uh, in that particular instant where the person is most likely to buy it, I think there will be the most impact in terms of um, how much you're telling. Oh, so so now, now you're arguing that it is better, but remember, you're still defending that there should be a right to information. Why is me just putting text not fulfilling the government's duty to inform people about them being complicit in their harms? Um, I suppose it's not the complete information, right? Because when you are showing the graphic images, it's only then that the people are actually getting an idea of what they are actually right. consuming. But by text, it's not the same thing. You, right. it's, still there. it's still there that tobacco is injurious to your health, but we still put pictures so that uh, the, the pe uh, people get a better picture of what the problems actually are rather than, you know, so now can, I think you're getting closer. So now you've identified that pictures have more of an impact on people than text do. Why is that the case? Why is it that just intuitively, if I see a picture of like a sausage in like a supermarket, which has like a pig dying, I'll be less likely to buy it than, yeah, Amrita. So like number one, um... So like a lot of people understand uh, visuals better. And then like, say, for example, I may skip reading what's written over there. But then when there's an image over there that it catches my attention at that point in time. And then when we do see that kind of a suffering placed over there, 
um there's always this second thought that the, uh, that would come up of like whether or not this purchase should be made or at least for the most basic sense for people to know about how things are being done over there and then also it's not just the rich people like consuming meat or like the literate ones who are consuming it say for example if i only wrote it like a lot of illiterate people also purchase meat at the same time so like on a smaller level the ones who also could not read can have access to this right to information which i would ignore if it was just text over there so like if i had to cover my entire mark like all of my consumers so i should also ensure that all categories of people are being covered yeah i mean i i didn't think of that but that sounds like a plausible reason uh all right and now the last thing i want you to look at are analogies what is a simile for an analogy you want to think about a principle like something that we already do that most people would agree is good that is similar to this policy so what is something like that um as we've discussed i think it's putting like photos of lung cancer on tobacco that uh, can i have one more because again what are we trying to prove here we're not trying to just prove the right to information we're trying to prove why graphic images lead to the right of information being fulfilled so what other groups use graphic and for graphic images uh, i'm not sure if this is valid but can we just say this is the reason why like comics are a lot more attractive this is the reason why when we see news it's much better if we see like visual news than tr- simply written news I think that's valid. As in, um, yeah, that's what we call like an intuition pump. Like intuitively, yes, that makes sense. But that's not an exchange for an analogy. But you can say that. Yeah, talk about charities. Like, yeah, yeah, that's that, that's the one I was thinking about. So often charities which want you to donate will put up pictures of like starving and very skinny children rather than just saying. there is a child and this is the statistic of whatever the number of people who are harmed can we also continue and argue in this very argument that look at the end of the day it doesn't even matter where you're putting uh, what the image is right let's just assume that this image is not that moving at the very end of it what matters is the positioning of that image because at the end of the day what we're looking at are consumers which are actually caring about the let's say the expiry date of the product or the amount of quantity or the price of the product and the moment they like switch to the back side of it and they see an image and they try to dwell over the fact of what that image is saying then that creates much more awareness that creates much more like the right to information part of it than anything else that the government would try to do so like it's trying to put the information the way the consumer can actually access to it all right yeah i think that's fair now i really want to take a screenshot and remember when making a principal argument follow the steps in this exact order and all of your principal arguments must have all four steps without that it is not a principle here's a pro tip when rebutting a principle this is often the place where people miss out the most people will go on and on about your right to privacy your right to information your right to speech and this and that but they won't tell you often in debates why this particular policy is the only way to achieve that principal duty and when you're rebutting a principal you can well, we will get to that in a second but just i just while you take a screenshot know this for rebuttal and i'll just put in yellow yeah ananya ah uh, so just a question would it be useful to mention um the ignorance of people within this argument like we could have an argument based on the fact that despite having a lot of information on all of these topics people are still ignorant and people still choose to do things and a graphic image is enough to really settle that fact in and prevent people from doing things they already know about yeah but i still think that's the same argument because if you go a little deeper into like why are people ignorant 
I think you'll end up coming back to some of these reasons. All right. But there may be more reasons. Like, yeah, NECOPS is not, there's not an exhaustive list. And there's just off the top of my head. Yeah, Devyansh? Um, so in a debate, if uh, something is part of the fundamental rights of the people, does that also have to be proved as a principal argument or yeah. can we just slide it because it's part of the constitution? No, no. You, you, must, you always have to prove why it's important. Okay. And also like most debates won't like be like that. Most debates won't be like this house believes that people have a right to privacy. Like, yeah. You know, like most debates will be a little more than that. Has everyone taken a screenshot of this? Yes. All right. Now let's move on to practical argument generation. New motion, someone. Uh, this house believes that sport should remain uh, free of politics, uh, depoliticized. Uh, okay, can I have another motion? Not that that's a bad motion, I just don't like it. This yeah. house would... Yeah? Yeah, this house would dissolve seats in parliament for candidates under 30. Yeah, we'll do that. Right. So as with principal arguments, practical arguments all also have steps. Number one, argument title. This sounds very stupid, but this is one of the most important things that people get wrong. Your entire argument should be able, you should be able to sum up your argument in one sentence. A good way to do this is put the motion Then write, because, and then enter your title. So for example, we should reserve seats in parliament for candidates under 30 because, and then the title. And if your argument title doesn't fit into it like this, if it doesn't fit into the motion because title format and an acronym I've just made up is the MBD. So that's a good check for you to always run the MBD check, motion because, and then argument title. Next, problem identification. Uh, I'll just write down the steps and then we'll go through them. Uh, impacts of problem. All right. Someone give me an argument as to why we should reserve seats in parliament for candidates under 30. Uh, young individuals will be more represented in the democratic system. Uh, so that's the title. Uh, the problem... oh, one uh, let's get a bit more specific, right? Yeah, obviously. Not that that's not a good argument, but let's be a little more specific because the motion kind of implies that your title shouldn't be obvious. Like, obviously, we'll have more young representatives in parliament, but why is that a good thing? Uh, because it's like saying, and let me tell you the issue with that so that you don't repeat it. It's like saying, we should reserve seats in parliament for young people because there will be more young people in parliament. That still doesn't prove why we should reserve more seats for young people. So why is having more young people in parliament a good thing? Probably. Uh, yeah, Ananya? 
uh, democracies are supposed to be representative in nature and having young people in the parliament would uh, complete that necessity. Sounds a little more principally. Yashwin? Uh, young people will be more likely to vote. That's what I want. Young people will be more likely to vote. Uh, we'll just take this argument. All right. What is the problem? Uh, First, problem come on, repeat this using the MBT format. I know this sounds like a stupid exercise, but please just do it. Like literally, read it out. Uh, this house would reserve seats in Parliament for candidates on the thirty because younger people will be more likely to vote. Thank you. Right. Let's identify the problem now. Why don't young people vote today? And you can have two to three reasons here. Yes, name. All right. So, um, firstly, probably because they understand that they don't exactly have an impact upon the current legis legislations, understanding the age group, age groups that we have in the world right now. So, let's say that the middle age group that is thirty to forty-five to fifty is somewhat dominating the political sphere in regards to voting, right? And that the older one upon that is actually the one. Can, can you can you sum it up in one line? Because in debate speeches, you you need to say. What is the problem? One, two, three. A disconnect in the way legislations for younger people are surfacing up by the government because the government is not understood. Simple sentence. Right. Um, so probably to make it more simpler. No, no, as in grammatically. I want a simple sentence, not a compound sentence. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thanks for that. So um to make it much more connective for younger individuals for legislations to actually that's a compound it. sentence you do the honors no i know what your point is you need to learn to be precise all right so back to the main thing to make it more precise for individuals to actually participate in legislative bodies to have a further impact what is the problem? The problem is the fact that they are not able to connect with the current legislative exercise that are happening. So, for example, if the government pushes forward an act today... Wait, you've gone to compound again. They are not able to... They are not able to represent their problems in the current legislation. So, they are not represented. That's a simple sentence. But young people are more likely to vote the problem. They are not represented by politicians. In the current status quo, because the yeah. politicians... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get to that later. But that's a problem. They don't vote because they don't think politicians represent them. Correct? Right. I'm they don't see they have a meaningful choice. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of choice. Sure. Which is actually the same as the first. Um, can you expand that to make it different than the first reason? Yes, over here, it's more about like how different political groups, their activities aren't much different. Like they keep promising the same things. They don't see a difference between them. So, so they feel disenfranchised? Yes. As in they, they feel like politicians continue to lie to them. So they lose faith in the political system. No, that's not a problem. That's an impact of the first one. They are not being represented. Okay, wait. So these are two separate things. Number one is that they are not represented. Number two is that they are lied to. Oh, we have someone in the waiting room. All right, fine. Politicians make false promises. Yeah, uh, you've had your hand up for a while, Ashwin. Uh, 
Right. So I, I think my point was already covered. My point was uh, they are in yes, they lose faith in the political system. All right. I think that's a that's good enough for this drill. Now, what are the impacts of this problem? So let me just. What happens? Yeah, uh, can we Can we have mute if there's like, thank you. Now, what are the impacts of this problem? Why is this a problem I should care about? Okay, young people aren't represented by politicians. Okay, politicians make false promises so people don't vote. Why is that a bad thing? Why is it a bad thing that people don't vote? Man? Mm hmm So that is the first office argument being like the young people are going to be the future and that to make sure that the future is represented in the current as well. We need to make sure that young, uh, politicians actually do care about what these what the priorities are of this entire age group but also note that how this is legislatively more good because right now what we're saying in the status quo is a disconnect between the policies that happened earlier and a disconnect between the policies that are happening right now to ensure continuity we need to make sure that there is continuity in the existing generation gap as well and to make sure that for the political representation of all age groups is something that is required okay not future. The all right. What else? Um, um there's there's stagnation of ideas. So like if more people do not vote, there'll be no further representation and no further, you know, change in the system because right now people do not vote because they do not see a viable choice. But and why is stagnation and why stagnation of ideas a bad thing? stagnation of ideas is a bad thing because it won't bring development right um once uh, the politicians are able to bring out new policies and new ideas it's only then when everyone will be affected so the main problem like for example the budget right if the polity if the parliament isn't able to you know bring out a good budget it impacts everyone fair enough so right now i'm not writing all that but know that in each of these steps you can't just say future generations are not protected. You need to tell me why it's important that future generations are protected. And that comes under impacts of the problem. So certain policies are- Yeah, so, well, so, so we will get to that in examples, but do we have any other impacts of what happens when politicians make false promises or- I have one. Uh huh. So like, um, say for example, in a country like India, where the median age is 28, and these people lose out on voting. So we lose out in the opinion of a large group of people. And then when they don't put out uh, uh, their opinion out there, and then uh, political groups and, uh, keep doing things that these people don't really agree with, then in the long run, this under 30 population which will eventually like hmm. be middle-aged and even once they reach their 40s or 50s it would be like they in the long run they would lose out faith on the political systems and then like even then their vote which now they're not doing because at present itself they feel they're not represented even when they reach their 40s or 50s they would still feel underrepresented and then there wouldn't be yeah. really voting. I think, I, I, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. So now we have a good set of impacts. Now, can anyone guess what uniqueness of solvency means? What's unique with a solution? Why is it better than all others? Um, why is emotion the only way to achieve? Emotion? Yeah. Why is reservation the only way to solve for all of this because let's analyze the alternatives that are present right okay. so what sort of what sort of governments are we witnessing right now we're witnessing autocratic writers governments that actually do not care that much about freedom of speech or wait wait wait, wait. Well, why sorry why we 
why are we witnessing autocratic right wing governments like in india maybe but like like uh, globally as well what we're seeing is a shift against western ideas right because let's just note what's happening in america let's just note what's happening in various western countries but except the scandinavian countries probably what you're seeing is the discontent against protests mainly okay okay not- okay but can you tie this back to why reservation is important right so what i was trying to drive towards was that because of these alternatives being inefficient in their very let's say principle or the fact that they do attach such an antagonistic idea to the entire movement pushed forward by the younger generation they end up doing at least no practical change in the real world but the moment you provide extra let's say reservations to these people they end up bringing in practical change and this is where we come with, come up with the example but of my question how- is why will they only bring about practical change if reservations are made why won't they do it like you said alternatives don't work what are alternatives to this policy that could get young people involved in other words what are some policies that opposition would support to make young people more involved in politics which are not reservations probably they push forward the idea for protest that's let's say there are student political organizations and that okay, they wait, wait, wait. student unions what else protests against government policies okay. then they can probably push for the idea okay, that okay. wait let's have uh, some other people tell us what are some other ways that you can social solve? media i guess they yeah, were saying that social media awareness uh information campaigns or something that every of team says in this motion all right now it is your job to tell me why none of these alternatives work and why only reservations work because for the effectivity of all these alternatives that there is like a requirement of the government to actually listen to these people right that i can go ahead and protest on any national highway for about 24 days if the government is not going to listen to me then the government is not going to listen to me in that scenario it becomes a bit redundant for these people to actually participate in such activities and that how there is no confirmation of action at and, and 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 why does the government not have an incentive to listen right now because the government because if you are speaking against someone then that against someone is actually not going to listen to you right because the government is at the end of the day ruled by a political party a political party that is there to hold power by the very nature of this organization it would try to uh, squabble down upon dissent as yeah yeah yeah. yeah 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 understood that, that's a fair argument ashwin i think uh, a bit more to answer the question of why governments currently do not need to respond to all of this simply put because young people are not voting i think we've established that in the problem statement yeah right? but so that, that, that not voting self like okay Sorry, no so your, your, uh, your point was young people aren't voting but this entire argument is to prove that young people will vote now so our point is if the government is more representative and starts listening and starts solving like these two problems that we identified then young people will vote now why is the Absolutely. only way to solve these two problems this um wait i'm kind of confused right because yeah. if we are analyzing the alternatives alternatives the you know student unions protest whatever uh how why exactly would the government listen to you know student unions protests uh, that that's what i'm asking to prove so think about it like this proposition says young people do not vote because number one current politicians don't represent them and number two politicians make false promises opposition will say we agree but if student unions are created if people protest if we spread awareness through social media and launch information campaigns 
Young people will anyways be more likely to vote. You don't need to reserve seats in parliament for them. Yes, but so uh, how about the fact yeah, so that saying, okay, so saying things like you know government likes to hold power and government doesn't like to change. If they don't want to change and if they want to hold power, then they would listen to student unions, right? So that way, students will vote for them. What about the fact that I have one point? Politicians are often sidelined inside parties. How many politicians do you know who are under 30? Right, that's a fair point. Um, probably to drive that very idea, um, something that's a, that I had in mind was like, let's just analyze the current situation. Wait, Sne, before you, uh, Amrita had to hand up. So we'll do, we'll go to Amrita first. Uh, yeah. Yes. So like in our alternatives that we've provided, even if the government listens to all of these, so the political member or the leader acts as an intermediate over there. So there might be very selective about their opinions there might be manipulation that might be there but if we have these candidates who are under 30 directly over there then they can present their points straightforward without it having to be selective or manipulative yeah that's a good reason uh, but I also want then, so you need to go further. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but then in the debate, you'd also need to go further to explain why candidates under 30 won't get power in unless there are reservations. So like these two are kind of linked. But yeah, let's uh, have enough of that. Uh, last part again, examples and analogies. I thought a very efficient example of this would be caste reservations. That why do you have mm -hmm. caste reservations at the end of the day to yeah. involve people in, right? And I thought that was somewhat an answer to the uniqueness of solvency as well. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what are you looking at? You're looking at a political sphere that would push forward leaders that people want to be pushed forward, right? And in that scenario, you have people. Uh, you have a choice between candidates that are not good at all. So the one major statement that is probably present in like general talk is that we have an option of a better out of the worst. Yeah, yes. Uh, I I just wanted like some titles of examples because we need to go to drill. Just quickly, give me one or two more examples of where we reserve things. Um, religion, race. Sorry, religion is in, 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 in war. Um, so we have religious quotas in um, universities, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you guys have more uh, examples. I want to do it real now. Just take a screenshot. Has everyone taken a screenshot? Yes. All right, great. Uh, yeah. All right. That went well. Uh, chat. I have to go somewhere right now. Yeah, that's fine. Whoever had to leave. All right, so let's do a uh, drill where in which it'll be similar to what we did yesterday. One of you is going to present a principal argument. The other one's going to try to rebut it. Uh, and remember the structure. So, and remember the rebuttal tip I gave you. So now that I've told you the structure, those of you who are doing rebuttal, also think about where, which part of the argument you want to attack. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, once again. Oh, Ron has left. If he comes back, he'll be with me. All right. Devyan, your prop, Amrita, your rib. Oh, why don't we do like deliver arguments for both sides? So proposition and opposition. Uh, 
So Devyansh and Amrita, you're on principle um, on the motion. Uh, one motion. One second, let me just pull up my lovely list of motions. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you. So we'll have four of you delivering principal arguments, three delivering, or three delivering principal, four delivering practicals. So Divyansh, can I have a principal argument on the proposition on one side? Just... Ooh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I won't be. Yeah, no, no, no worries. That that's okay. All right. So, can I have a proposition principle on this motion from Devyansh, and an opposition principle from Amrita? Actually, no. This is a little difficult. Let's not. Uh, Forget this. Uh, it's it's an interesting one, but it's it's. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just going through more. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, okay now. Okay, this is a good one. Uh, okay, wait, you know what? I'll just make up motion. No, make up, but like tell you more things. Uh, give me principles on this house would make COVID-19 vaccinations compulsory. So Devyansh proposition, Amrita opposition. If anyone's feeling like taking a challenge, you can do, is there anyone who wants to do an opposition principle on the first one? I'd like to do an opposition on the first one. Uh, all right. So, okay. So, Sne, you can do prop. Ashwin, you can do op on the first one. You both that. Uh, Sampavan and Anya, you both are also speaking. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, uh, so your motion is this has to Okay, uh, do you know what a 100% inheritance tax is? Um, I assume it's exactly how it sounds like you, there's a 100%. Yeah. So inheritance doesn't exist. So no. your parents, so some of your proposition and Anya, your opposition. You guys can take about five minutes. A principle or a practice? Uh, uh, oh, right. Um. The people doing the robots one do practical arguments. Uh, COVID do principle. Inheritance do principle. Okay, and just to confirm, like this 100% inheritance tax means that if my father has any money in his bank account, when he dies, I will get none of that money or it means that any property left behind will not? Every, you, both. Okay. That's actually a good question. It depends on how you model it, but usually both. Okay, assume it to be both. Okay. Like, I don't know if it's wealth and income or if it's only about income inheritance. But most inheritance is wealth, so... I'll be back in about five minutes. Remember, follow the structure. I'll be very upset.
if any of you need to leave make sure you send a recording of whatever i've assigned to you uh and i'll be back in like 5 minutes i'll give you a little time to prepare your arguments sandha real prop right yeah One moment. I'm right. Uh, do you also want us to give a setup, or do you only want? No, to... just the argument. All right. Uh, start with the MBT format. All right. Yes. Everyone. Uh, Ronav, are you feeling well enough to give thoughts or help me adjudicate as you did yesterday? I'll take that as a no. All right, let's start. Who was on making COVID nineteen vaccinations compulsory? Um, it was I think I and uh, Amrita. All right, let's hear it. I was like, um, I hope I'm audible. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, if I um crack in between, um, it might be just because my internet's terrible. And apologies for that. Uh, okay. Why should we make COVID nineteen vaccinations compulsory? Because of the individual's obligation towards the well being of the members of the society. Now, why is essentially is this the most important principle to be followed? It's because at the end of the day. Uh, it is this principle that you know it shows uh, every individual reaps the benefits of the uh, hard work done by the member of the society. A society is developed on the uh, uh, way and individuals interact with each other. Therefore, a decision made by an uh, individual, if it harms the society, in terms harms itself and the entire well-being of the society. 
moreover we uh, need these uh, things because um every luxury that a person gains is because of the work that's done by his or her peer and therefore the main reason that it should be followed is because it prevents the action against society so if a person does not have any obligation towards society he would tend to take actions that mostly benefit him and or him or her and not the his you know neighbors or other members around him finally the main reason that you know it's extremely imperative for us that this uh, things exist is because it prevents us from going into anarchy it prevents the society from crumbling down solely because um people you know take actions that are good for themselves and the society now the reason why uh, making covid-19 vaccinations compulsory is the only way to uh, implement this uh, principle is because of a single reason that uh, at the end of the day if we give people choice they might choose uh, they might to make decisions that you know uh, such as not taking the covid vaccine in the first place which would not you know uh, solve the pandemic crisis we have already seen the problems that this pandemic pa uh, pandemic has caused we have seen the deaths we have seen the destruction that it has caused and um, since covid-19 vaccinations are the sole uh, solution for it at the moment we believe that making it compulsory is the sole choice you know actually enforce this principle another example of uh, individual's obligation could be seen in the enforcement of the indian penal or penal code or penal code of any other countries where those or the or documents were enforced because to you know prevent people from taking actions that harm the society or or, or people around them in general all right um everyone should be listening to like the feedback i gave other people so you don't repeat the mistakes overall that was pretty good um a few different issues uh number 1 i think you spent too long on the first part which is explaining why the principle is important i think you got it spot on as to how if you reap the benefit of other people working in society you also therefore have an obligation to them i want i would have wanted an example over here so examples don't always need to come at the end examples should come throughout so you should give me an example of how i reap the benefits of hard working of society a good example of this is other people pay taxes so that i can have like roads built for me or free welfare or other people follow the law so i live in a safer society so i have an obligation back to them um and then i think you went a little extreme when you went towards the whole anarchy bit so it just made you sound a little extreme don't do that um you follow the structure well i'll i'll give you that uh, and i was overall pretty happy like happy with the way you made this argument uh in the in terms of your uniqueness this part needed to be stronger so you said if there is a choice people may not take it fair but why is them not taking it going to not solve the pandemic so over here because an obvious example for the other side would they'll be like most people are likely to take it like 90% of people don't want covid and that's enough to solve the pandemic because herd immunity is a thing so i needed a reason why every single person needs to take it um so your uniqueness wasn't that unique um and lastly make your examples more specific so rather than just saying the indian penal code give me an example of a place where we would like violate someone's right to bodily autonomy because that's what we're doing right by forcing you to like put a needle into yourself what are what is an example of like something similar that we do so your example should be a little more specific um can we have the opposition principle now uh and again this feedback i want everyone to follow but overall uh, good i really like that you follow the structure uh who is up on this that's me amrita all right let's go yes so in the motion this house would make covid 19 vac uh, vaccinations compulsory it would number one violate the right uh, violate the freedom to choice it violates the right to consent to medical treatment and the right to bodily autonomy and like one side can you take 30 seconds and choose just one okay um i'll go with the second one it violates the right to uh it, it violates the right to consent to medical treatment and making wait, covid wait, wait. Is, is that a 
Okay. Uh, can you make one on bodily autonomy? I think that's a stronger one. Okay. So take 30 seconds to like reframe it. Because I'm happy you identified it. Uh, I think that's the stronger one. And that's why I want you to make that argument. Also, the medical consent thing will end up coming back to choice or bodily autonomy when you explain it. It's not a principle itself. Like you surely end up saying, why should you have, why should you have to consent for medical treatment? Because of your right to choice. So did you get what I'm saying? It, it'll come yes. back to one of those two things. Like better pick up the stronger one and have others within it. Yes. So like, should I? Yeah. And again, MBT. I just want this house or forget this house. We should not make, your starting sentence should be, we should not make COVID-19 vaccinations come Pulsary because, and then the title of your argument. Go. Okay. So, this house should not make COVID 19 vaccinations compulsory because it violates the right to bodily autonomy. And this is important because, number one, people lose out the very basic choice that has been given to them. It's a, a sense of fear eventually develops inside them when something is directly made to be compulsory when and in such a situation they may or may not be educated about it they might always be worried about this about the implications that might come up in them say for example even in the initial stages in india a lot of people between the ages of 40 to 50 died because of covid 19 vaccinations so when something is directly made compulsory um, and when they're not being and when they're not being educated about it, uh, um, they start becoming worried about it and they fear about their very existence. And it's not just about this. For how long would you make things compulsory? You can't keep making things compulsory continuously because people would eventually lose faith in the systems that are there. And this is not the only way to achieve our very basic um a very basic outcome over here which is to protect uh, which is to uh uh which is to solve the pandemic and uh only uh providing vaccinations is not the only way that we can solve the pandemic there are so many other ways that we could do this say for example the quarantine worked very well and people were eventually adapting to these systems as well and a better way to actually um take vaccinations is to educate them about it it may take a while but then protecting their rights and respecting their individuality over here is more important and even when these rules and regulations are put out a large protest might be made outside people might start revolting and in a pandemic situation when people do come out in person that might again just go out um, and increase the pandemic um which serves again uh, which serves against our um, aim of solving the pandemic and about and, and about um, whether or not these things have been done in the past uh, so in the healthcare system itself people are provided uh, with the informed consent to clinical treatment nobody can get um, injections are like they cannot be tested without their consent being taken in prior so within the space of medical treatment itself people have been given consent for a very long time from a very long time and then violating it for a purpose that we aren't very clear isn't something that's going to be fruitful i thought that was good uh people who had a basic choice sense of fear worried about side effects all of that is fair. I would add some things like a lot of people consider it like a violation of their religion uh, and that being important. Uh, just generally, you should be allowed to feel safe, all of that kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the part that I didn't like so much is when you're like, we can't keep making things compulsory, mostly because I don't see a link between making COVID-19 vaccinations compulsory and then 
everything else becoming compulsory. If you want to make that argument, you need to tell me why that leads to that. Okay. You understand? Uh, not the only way to achieve the outcome. Again, providing vaccinations is not the only way. Is probably something I wouldn't say in a debate because vaccinations are probably the best way to deal with pandemics. And you said quarantines work very well, but people also lost a lot of jobs and things like that. The better part of this was education. And what I really, really liked and what all of you should take back is when she was like, it is better to educate them about it and protecting their rights is more important even if the pandemic is a little longer. That is the type of explicit comparison that your principles need to have. So that was really good. Your point about protests is valid, except that's a practical point. So I probably wouldn't put in a principle. I would move it down to a separate part of your speech. That's a valid point. I think your example was good. Overall, well done. Thank you. Uh, right. Now let's have the practical argument on this crazy robots motion. Whose proposition? I am. All right. All right. I'm just so like I have an idea. How long is it supposed to be? Please don't make it longer than two and a half minutes. Thanks for that. All right. Starting in three, two, wait. So, yeah, starting in three, two, one. We would allow people to carry out actions that would otherwise be illegal on living beings because we need to establish a certain sort of distinctification between artificial intelligence and robots and human beings. Why is this the case? Because we understand that the way machinery is made effective is by actually using it for that particular and unique use case. What does this look like? This looks like each and every mechanical equipment and each and every artificial intelligence product that we have in our life being used separately as a different entity than what a living being would look like, right? And why is this actually an effective problem? Note that how the purpose of any technological equipment can only be fulfilled when it is actually used as a distinctif uh, distinctification to all other things that living beings were doing. What is the impact of this? The impact of this is simple. Understand that the moment you try to use something as equal to another, another thing that was actually made to make the, make the first object actually become better, you somewhat undermine the efficiency of both. That is to say, artificial intelligence was made to make human actions better. In that scenario, if they fail to do that, because you do not let them do that, because you do characterize them as similar to living beings at large, you're somewhat undermining the unique use case, and you're undermining the purpose of artificial intelligence at large, and also the way it is used in our world. Note that what is the uniqueness of our model then? Our model would make sure that A, you're able to establish an alternative framework wherein you're able to parallelly characterize the way you're using this technology, but also you're making sure that in developing and underdeveloped worlds wherein humans would always be cheaper than artificial intelligence there is again an effective use case and a different use case for them because if the opposition right now comes ahead and says that in dangerous way situations or manufacturing situations artificial intelligence would end up proving it's in uh, its unique use case we can simply argue back with that that how it would not be present in developed and in developing countries and most in developed countries also because the very way human labor would always be more cheap than machinery. Note that the main example of this is the way we actually use everything. The only reason I can throw a bottle and not a child is probably because the bottle is a non-living thing and the child is a living thing. So for me to actually break that, uh, that robot or for me to actually do anything that might be perceptibly wrong to do to a living thing is actually clearly valid because A, that is a non-living thing and it does follow different characterization. All right. Good argument. Two things. Number one, this is a phrasing thing. You use a lot of pronouns like this, something, that, this, that, the other. Replace them with nouns or proper nouns because it's a little hard to, like I was able to understand your argument, but a lot of people may not follow. So if I'm, 
I think your exact words were, if you try to use something as equal to another, another thing try, another thing tries to make the first object better, undermining the efficiency of both. I don't know what things are being referred to at all in this sentence. So, um, please, like, say, like, if you are to compare a human and an AI, da 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 da. Your argument was valid, but you did not prove one thing. Particularly, this became very apparent in your example. Can the opposition speaker tell me what she did not prove, which is an underlying premise of her argument? Like, yeah, that AI is property and that AI does not. You know, that AI is property, as in like it's non-living. Yes, you did not actually prove to me that a robot is non-living. Like, surely there's a reason why this motion was set, right? Obviously, it, it can't be that prop weighted. So think a little deeper. Your argument was great that if, if you start using human standards on, on AI, it defeats the entire purpose of having AI. But you need to prove that AI, that robots aren't living things. But what I will say is that would come in a principle. So I would assume that you have proved that, but I would still need some direct references, especially in the example that AI is. And you may, and okay, this may just be me, because I do a lot of work with AI and read up a lot about it. So I may be picking on this a little bit, but there is great debate between the AI community as to what type of models we should apply as AI gets more and more sophisticated. So I didn't actually expect you to know that, uh, but it's increasingly gonna become a really important discussion in society. So read up about it. Anyways, let's hear the opposition argument, Ashwin. Uh, am I on it? Yeah. So this house would allow people to own their own AI robots and carry out actions on these robots that would otherwise be illegal. Um, now this house would not allow that because this would constitute in some part at least offenses against something that is living, offenses against something that is um, that is living. Now, importantly, let's define why what exactly this AI is, right? In do I need to characterize actually just like interject for a second? Yeah. Um, if your argument to stand like that this is an advanced motion, but yeah. But yeah. So yeah. I'll I'll okay, so I'll continue with my characterization. Okay. So it's important to define what exactly this AI is and how exactly this is in fact living. Now, artificial intelligence, as the name suggests, it implies that this robot has some level of intelligence. It has some ability to think for its own. And I think that is fundamentally what makes it living, right? I think, therefore, I am. And this robot thinking implies that it is. Now, why is this? Because, you now, what are the impacts of this? Sir? So what are the impacts of this? The impacts of this are as follows. Um, uh, first of all, you're committing offenses against the living. If this is as simple as violating labor laws, that still is a violation against, you know, the hopes and dreams of this AI. If it thinks that, you know, if it wants to do something with itself, if it is uh, sentient, if it is intelligent and by extension sentient, it has some hopes and dreams, it has some awareness of itself, right? And that awareness of itself is going to be diminished in this situation. This um, by treating AI as property, wherein people can own AI and exploit AI as much as it can, it diminishes the AI's use of itself and it diminishes um, its own fundamental um, sentience. Now, secondly, this sets an important precedent as to what exactly is being treated, right? Uh, how exactly things are being treated. If you take you know, 300 years past, slavery was the same justifications were used to you to justify slavery, right? White people claimed that black people were property, that they did not have a life of their own, they did not have sentience, and therefore it was justifiable to exploit them. 
and i think that is a uh, that is a president we should not be setting once again uh, that's a president we should not be setting once again now secondly why is this the only way of solving this problem why can we not set some regard of uh, safeguards again this comes down to the presidents which we set right the second we say that ai is in any form less than humans we create a president that you know it is justifiable to exploit something that is lesser than a human and that isn't the case right? it is never justifiable to exploit something for personal gain uh with this i'd like to conclude this speech yeah. that was actually really good like uh, like that, that that was a well developed document the only honestly at this stage i actually don't have any feedback i'm really happy with that document uh the only thing is um i have to think i'm not going to lie because of my like own beliefs i may be like over crediting this argument i definitely do have feedback for it but most of that is based on things that i have not taught you guys yet so would not expect you to implement so based on just argument structure you implemented it well and explained the argument well um the missing parts were things that i haven't got you well so uh, taught you yet so good job on that uh yeah let's hear the principal on i just had one doubt mhm mm right so um i didn't understand that how you can i understand that it would have come in the principled argument but how do you prove that ai is non living understanding that it's at the end of the day a robot right so if it's a robot uh, i mean how do you prove it's non living you say that like you say that just because something has the capacity to make decisions doesn't mean it has like emotions or feelings or rights also like animals can make decisions but like we don't apply human standards to animals either right so like these are just analogies that are in my head but um we i i really enjoy this topic so we can go on and on and we can have a separate discussion about this uh but i i want to hear everyone speak so uh can i have the principal on the inheritance tax yeah so um should i begin yeah right so then why do we think that inheritance tax is so important and why do we think that's a good thing right we think because inheritance as a concept is simply immoral right why is this the case because we think that it violates the right to equality that all each and every citizen should um should be able to uh, have how does this happen we think this happens in two key ways firstly we think that the state has an obligation to ensure no firstly what is this right of equality which is being violated by this inheritance two things firstly that the state has an obligation to ensure that each and every citizen in the country are treated equally and have equal opportunities what does this look like we think that this looks like not discriminating in workplaces to some example and i'll get back to how this applies to inheritance but then secondly more than that we believe that there has to be an equality in reward right this looks like saying that if i work 100 hours i will get 1000 rupees if i work 10 hours i will get only 100 rupees we think that there has to be like a certain proportion where your the amount of work you do um the amount of hard work you put into something uh, does actually depend on the uh, amount of reward you get right so then why is the right to equality so important two things firstly we believe that all humans are created equal we think that it's a fundamental thing to discriminate between people based on factors which is not directly due to their own efforts so this means that we're not against um we're not against like let's say rich people buying yachts simply because they have worked their entire life to actually gain this money what we are against is people becoming rich which has nothing to do with their own efforts their own hard work but then secondly we think that the building blocks of all civilization lies on the fact that all men and women are created equal both in opportunity reward and they should be treated so now why does inheritance go against this right to equality but first i just want to talk about money right so this debate takes under like the underlying fact that we think that a large like in for a large majority of cases money either is or leads to a reward for most human beings right this looks like taking a vacation which is rewarding this looks like buying let's say a 
PS5, which is rewarding. So like opposition can't come here and argue and say that, well, money doesn't really have anything to do with reward because for a large amount of cases simply does. We accept that for some cases, money is just not enough for them to be happy. But we, like I said, for a large amount of cases, this is the case. Now, we think that inheritance means that children have access to opportunities in their life due to something which is not accrued by their own efforts, right? This looks like this looks like I this looks like I'm like this looks like someone buying a yacht because their father left them money when they died, but they really haven't done anything in their lives to deserve a yacht. We think that this is a principal harm. But then secondly, we think that um we think that wealth also opens opportunities to one's life again, which is not something not something which they have actually deserved, which they have done anything to deserve. This looks like um this looks like since you're rich, you know some people and those people can do things for you. We think all this is simply um, unethical aim model because we think that reward should be based on merit. We think that the right to equality is really important when it comes to rewards as well. Now, why is this the only way to ensure that uh, this right is not violated? Because opposition might come here and argue, well, instead of 100% inheritance act, we should have like, let's say 50% inheritance act. Why does this not work? Well, firstly, I just want to know that this means that opposition agrees with our principle and our moral and the fact that they think that children are not morally deserving of this wealth to at least some extent, which their like parents have left it behind, which they have had no, um, no like, no direct share in uh, actually accruing that wealth, right? So this means that we already win this clash at the point at which they ex uh, agree with our more, 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 agree with our model. But then secondly, we think that there can be no money left behind because even if you're just left with 50%, that still means that you have a substantial amount of capital to actually go ahead, buy something. If like, if like your parents left behind $10 million and your $5 million, and we still think that's a substantial amount of money, therefore it doesn't work. Now, what can this be um what can this be analogized with what is this equal living to we think that this is uh equal living to why on principle you shouldn't be able to get a job in a company simply because your parents know the owner of it right because at because at that point, uh, we're simply equating the fact that you're getting a job in a company with getting wealth because of something which is not by your own efforts. We think this is the reason why Bill Gates doesn't really give his uh, kids so much money. We think that this is the reason why monarchies for the large part do not exist because because the children of those who have done things don't simply deserve those things simply because their parents have done it. Thank you. Yeah, really well made. The only thing is that you got really repetitive. So uh, I'd say keep an eye out on that. Everything you said made sense. Uh, but like, like, like uh, the first bit of your speech was actually great. The, um, I, I like the fact that you brought in examples like non-discrimination in the workplace, as well as how uh, reward and uh, reward no, and, and like work and effort put in um, should be same. So overall, the principle was good. It was actually great. Uh, just don't get repetitive. It's it, it's a bad habit that happens to everyone and it needs to stop now. Otherwise, it'll eat you up throughout your debating. Overall, once again, uh, nothing to say. Uh, well done. Uh, opposition? Yes. Uh, the proposition, can I go ahead? <laughs> yeah. The proposition surprisingly only looks at the very minority percent of the population that is rich. They talk about things like yachts and hundreds of millions of dollars passing down. But that is not the reality of the case for the majority of the population that, the, that this policy will be affecting. The majority of the population barely have any um, accumulation of wealth necessary to combat the times that we're living in, the times of recession. And they require further sustenance that have been inherited by their parents to make it through these things. The, op the proposition also doesn't justify why you would need to tax 100% at all, and why taxation is the only way to do this. Inheritance taxes can also contribute to leveling the playing field across individuals. If you look at minority communities, if you look at our communities that we have reservations for, those are all people that require social mobility. And those are all people that we create reservations for because of the fact that they do not have the same generational privileges as other people did. An inheritance tax will also not be very effective in any case because it will just encourage transference of wealth. You can just buy the same yachts that you mentioned. You can just buy another set of houses and pass that down to your children. And that will not be taxed in the same way. You can find offshore accounts and manage to do the same thing. 
So there is no justifiable way that this will be able to um, be implemented in a way that will not have any exceptions. But at its primarily level, 100% inheritance tax is just double taxation. You are already taxing money that has been uh, earned by their parents and that's earned by their diseased parents. And this is just getting taxed twice. I do not see how that can be an equal argument to police. If the money that a, a person has earned has already been taxed, that is already an equalization of society's um, accounts of money. Furthermore, it just destroys familial connections and the structure of family that's created. In most poor families, a parent does not want to see their children go uh, without any backup. Children have to earn for their parents and give back. And same way the parents have to do for their children too. Uh, but primarily my argument is that uh, you tax transactions and not technicalities. Therefore, adding a secondary layer is not important. Effective taxation of personal capital income, having better tax design could achieve the very same things that the proposition is trying to achieve. And helping the poor through taxing um, inherited money would be useless rather than just having better utilization of the taxes that the government already possesses. Okay, so first off, Ananya, you didn't make a principal argument, which was the exercise. So, Go back and make a principle and send me a recording of it using the structure, please. But on what you did say, on your rebuttal, I like I like your reframing. I think it was important. Um, I also think that was a glaring issue in proposition's case um, that they sort of only thought about rich people. And that's correct. You... He kind of did justify why 100% inheritance tax is important. He said that his whole principle of equality of opportunity. So if you are rebutting it, again, I'm not really going to like blame you for this because we haven't done rebuttal yet, but just because, because I don't want to just be like, go record now. Yeah, right. I actually want to give you some feedback. It's good to rebut the reasoning. Um. You mentioned a bunch of stuff that can be used as principles, but what you did is what a lot of people do, which is say a lot of things, a lot of different ideas, but not explain them. It is always better to stick with two or three ideas, but explain them really well. Some examples of ways you can make a principle argument, getting taxed twice, the relationship between children and parents. These are two things that you mentioned, which already can be made independent principles. Also, uh, when you're recording a principle and sending it to me, think about the right to die and why that's an important right, as in the right to choose what happens after you die. Yes, all right. So that's just a, a hint of how you could uh, build a principle. Uh, otherwise, rebuttal was, I mean, given the fact that we haven't learned rebuttal yet, good i have high hopes for when i give you a rebuttal format but you do have down the format right yes. of principle. so record a principle and send it to me i will do that all right that is uh